Good morning, Interweb. Welcome back to the Artifexian podcast in this month's episode. Is Germany all that and a bag of pumice? Are AAA games too bloated? What even is a graph? There's a hostile takeover in E. Cairn. Abeski has finally got some, brackets, a lot of cases. Demonstratives, suffix of Nama, and Bill makes some calls, Ori pronouns. All that, plus lots more, in this month's episode. Bill, hello. How are you? Edgar. Hello. I am I'm well. How are you? I I I am good. Any any banter in your life before we start? No. No banter. That's not what the show notes says. <laughs> <laughs> um banter. Um I was in Berlin recently. That was a lot of fun. Ganz gut. Viva ja. Berlin. Uh yeah, uh, sehr, sehr good. Sehr, sehr good. Uh was hast du gemacht in Berlin? What did you do in Berlin? Um Ich habe in See geschwommen. You swam in the sea. In a lake. In a lake. Uh, what's the word for lake? Meer. I can't. I can. I always confuse See and Meer. Uh, no, See must be a sea, but Meer. I think this is the thing. I think there's like. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry for the Germans listening. I think there's like Das Meer und Der Meer, and I think one means a lake and the other one means like the ocean. You know, I think, I think that's come up before, and that sounds familiar. I I, I, right. I, we've been doing this a long time, Bill. Things are, We're about to repeat, repeat ourselves. I'm just going to wiktionary that while, real fast while you continue to tell everyone how well, how much of a delightful time you've had. Um, yeah, so the, the weather was very nice. So I saw on the lake, and I uh, went to a couple of museums, um, including one about the history of heavy metal in uh, East Germany. That was quite fun. Ooh. Quite interesting. Um, and I went to a Freiluft Kino. Freiluft Kino, so an open, open air cinema. An open air cinema, genau. Um, where I saw, for the first time, I hadn't seen it before, My Neighbor Totoro. Totoro, Totoro, <laughs> da, da, da. Oh, that's such a great film. What do you think of it? I thought it was lovely. I thought it was very, very sweet. And it was really childlike. It doesn't really have a plot exactly. It's just kind of a bunch of vignettes, which is something that I, I often enjoy when it's done well. Um, uh, you know, like, there's no like through line from the start to the finish. It's just stuff that happens. And uh, I thought that what I, one thing I really like about it is Totoro is, is actually quite scary, I think. Like he, he's kind of very alien and, and sort of monstrous in a hmm. way, but he's nothing but, but perfectly kind and pleasant. Hmm. Um, and I thought, you know, it's nice. I think a lot of media can be kind of a little bit cynical about cute things and, and make them, you know, it's very it's very cheap and easy to, to like twist something around by saying, oh, this cute thing is actually horrible. You know, like when Winnie the Pooh went into public domain, someone immediately made like a, a film about a, a serial killer or something or a monster, Winnie the Pooh, which is very low effort as a concept. I haven't seen the film. It may be a great film. So it was just nice to see something that was just kind of cute and had like this kind of scary element to it that just never gets um, worked into anything. It's just left because Totoro was nice. I agree. I don't think I... Um, or I agree with the sentiment, but I don't, I don't think uh, when I first saw it, I would have interpreted Totoro as being scary. But then again, my, my bar for like things that are meant to be the things that are not meant to be scary but actually are kind of scary is stuff like et that et man like that alien as a kid that was like that freaked the living daylights out of me like i couldn't sleep after watching that i thought it was just horror like horrific and so that that's what i when i think of like things that are actually cute but a little bit horrifying that's what i think of when i think of that not total total i just think it's full cute um but yeah, uh, it, great film. Uh, I, I find it, I don't know, maybe it's just because I have brain rot or something, but I find, uh, I, I enjoy a lot of Miyazaki films, but I find them a little bit difficult to watch sometimes just because of that sort of like, there is no plot. It's like a series of vignettes. Everything, the pacing is very alien to what like kind of I'm used to consuming. Um, mm. And that can make it a little bit difficult to watch. It, it, I liken it a little bit to the, the Miyazaki films to listening to contemporary classical music and um, in that I can't describe that as an easy thing to do, do you know, but it's an interesting thing to do, and I enjoy doing it. You know what I'm saying? 
I think that is a comparison that has probably never been made before. <laughs> but do you see what do you see where I'm getting at, though? Like, I do, I, I do see what you're getting. I do see what you're getting at. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean about the vignette thing, and it's something that can be quite uh, off-putting. The, as I said, I do, I do like it sometimes, um, because I, I think we're very obsessed with um, really like tightly written plots in cinema, and it's yeah. nice to have that turned around. And also it works in this because it's about kids and it's just like, I don't know, it kind of makes sense for, for seeing something from a child's perspective that it would just be kind of a bit more messy. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I want to uh, point out. We're seeing it through, oh, what's her name? Is it May? Is May her name? Is it? One of them is called May anyway. I forget, I forget what, what they're both called. Yeah, we're seeing it through, through their eyes and that it has all the madness of how a kid must view the world. Mm. Um. Which I think is really interesting because we're kind of getting like, we're, we're getting an adult's version of how a kid might view a world, which is a sort of like, there's like an infinite loop thing going on there, which I find a little bit interesting to think about because how does the <laughs> adult know how the kid, like, because I don't know how baby Edgar processed the world. That information is entirely gone to me. Is that a yeah. thing that adults retain or are we just kind of, is this like a hyper real depiction of how kids think of the world? Yeah. Um, again, infinite loop engaged, brain melt. <laughs> um, but it's a good film it's a very good film um, like uh, uncontroversial thing to say Miyazaki films are very good uh, as a whole Wiktionary for the noun mea has it in the uh, neuter and it's saying that it means sea um, the archaic version of this apparently is lake uh, but I was full sure you have das mea und der mea but that Wikipedia does not or Wiktionary does not seem to be giving me that it's all yeah, it's all just, or maybe I'm getting, no, I'm not. I was about to say, maybe I'm getting um, confused with the plural genitive, but I'm not because that would change the form of the noun as well. So I don't know where I'm getting that from. Germans, help me out, uh, please. Uh, der See is, is, is lake, and die See is the sea. And now that you brought that up, I believe DFYX, our German friend, might have pointed that out in Reddit. The yeah. last time we talked, yeah, okay. So. I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry, DFYX. I'm it's so sorry. It's <laughs> uh, It's been an idiot. Um, <laughs> so, uh, congratulations. Uh, oh, here, just real fast. Sorry, I'm so sorry, folks. We'll get into stuff in a bit. Um, Germany, right? Germany, Germany hosted the Euros, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Euros, for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a football competition. It's like the World Cup, but just for Europe. It's like an all Europe in, uh, international competition um, of of nations. Like nations play, not clubs. Nations play together. Um, that's the worst description of the Euros that's ever been said. But you know, you get my drift. Um, it was held in in Germany uh, this year, and um, as a result, all of the journalists journalists from all around Europe descended. Journalists. Germanlists. Did I say Germanlists? No, I said. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was funny. <laughs> that was very good. I like it. Um, uh, all of the journalists uh, from all across Europe descended upon Germany, obviously, to cover their nation's games. And as a result, and as what always happens when these comp- competitions occur, you get a lot of uh, sort of like. Um, Yelp reviews of the country, I guess, from these journalists, because they talk about being in the country and what it was like to navigate the country and moving around and getting from game to game. And like Germany is always seen, or at least in my eyes, it's always been seen as the pinnacle of efficiency, right? Like that's the German stereotype. Like you go to Germany and things are just done correctly. And the more I listen to these journalists talk about their experience of being in Germany, the more I'm like, I actually think that this is some sort of weird, like, uh, uh, Orwellian lie that we've been telling ourselves or we've been told that isn't actually true like Germany's always been very efficient when it's not efficient at all and th- no. the reason why I bring this up is because apparently the trains they failed to modernize their train system uh, and as such it's an unmitigated disaster uh, some English journalists were like our train system in Britain is awful you go to Germany and it's like an order of magnitude worse like I couldn't believe that you could do something worse than what we have in the UK Apparently that's the thing. Um, there's stuff like it's a heavy cash society, low cashlessness, which I guess depending on whatever side of the spectrum you, you lie on, you might think that's a good or bad thing. I think that's an extremely inconvenient thing. Um, everything shuts down on a Sunday, like everything. So it's it, that's an incredible inefficiency. If you don't have milk, you can't get milk on a Sunday because literally everything's closed. Um, 
Germany has an, or at least had, I think, an over-reliance on like coal and like the crap coal, apparently. There's different grades of coal, but they really like burning the coal that was the inefficient thing to burn. And it just seems like the more I hear about Germany of late, the more I'm like, I, is this this efficient utopia that we all think of? Um, and I'm wondering, did you experience any of this? Did you go to Germany and be like, this is how society should be ran? This is amazing. I mean, I think the public transport in Berlin is pretty good. I, I guess, I think I think when they were talking about trains, they were talking more about intercity, cross-country travel. Yeah, yeah, travel. Deutsche Bahn, yeah. yeah. Um, I, have, I have heard that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I was, I was in a, a large international capital city. Um, so that will obviously color my, my feelings in some way. Yeah, I thought, like, Berlin functions reasonably well in, in terms of getting around it and signs and things um, in a way that I, I think Dublin doesn't particularly do. Matt, um, du- Dublin, Dublin is a just, it, it, it's a very, it's not a good city. Yeah, the, 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 the cash thing it really confuses me, like wh- wh- why so few places can accept card at all. Mm-hmm. Never mind contactless, just like can't take card at all, I find very strange. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I'm I'm very much pro the existence of cash, but it, I, I would like it to be one option among others. <laughs> right, you you can you can have both. That's that's a useful thing to offer, you know. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I I just I want to just I'm sure we're all aware, but for any Germans listening, I'm half German here, so I feel like I have a slight right, to, like not right, but uh, it's not so bad if I mildly sag off Germany a little bit. I think it'd be different if I just like laid into France and I have no connection to France at all. Um, but you know, they do like surrendering and all that crack. Joke, joke. <laughs> Sorry. Vive l'Empereur. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, just, I, I don't know. Ger- Germany's weird. Germany's weird. Um, or at least my conception of Germany has been rattled a little bit. Here's a good way of summing up. Germany, I think maybe, is like many societies, it has pros and cons. That's it. I think in my head... Hot take. Hot take. I think in my head, <laughs> I, I was like, Germany just has no cons. It's everything is just like uh, really efficient and just works extremely well, which is obviously not the case. And I guess the Euros have uh, uh, what's called blown a, that misconception apart in my head. Anyhow, onwards... Onwards. Onwards. Folks, first official bit of, of follow-up here. Um, Discord. We have a Discord now. Um, that's actually yeah. a little little bit of a lie, uh, because I've always had a Discord, or I've had a Discord for many, many years. Uh, this Discord that I have is, pri- is, is only for talking to patrons of the main channel. It's a patron-only thing. Um, so I can post, you know, the various behind-the-scenes stuff and all that sort of crack. Um... As much as I think Discord is not the best platform in the world, uh, you know, the culture seems to have moved towards Discord and away from other places. So uh, we it would probably, it's incumbent upon us, I think, to have a Discord where people can come and talk about the channel, uh, talk about the, the episodes if they so desire. So the link to that should hopefully be in the description of this video. Uh, I will say, I will say, Discord for me is primarily, again, a patron engagement tool. So this is bare bones, right? And when I mean bare bones, I mean like there is a channel that is called Artifexian Podcast. And there I will post these episodes as a thread and we can talk about them, etc. Now, it may um, grow more, but right now it is a channel. Uh, I In my life, I need non-complicated things right now. So I'm not setting up a big elaborate thing. It can grow organically. So please just manage expectations here. D- if you don't want to use Reddit to talk to us and you don't want to email, you can go to that Discord. Um, questions, Bill? No. Cool. Very good. Conlang conflict, right? Um, for oh. the past number of weeks, a um, versus Sindarin. Let's go. Let's throw um, down. Uh, Sindarin wins every time. Every time. <laughs> no, um, for the past couple of weeks, I so there there we talked about this before. There's a YouTube channel called uh, Lang Time Studio, ran mm-hmm. by the unbelievable uh, David J. Peterson and Jesse Peterson. Um, where they are creating languages uh, for animals for a board game that they intend to release at some stage. It is great. If you're interested in Con Lang, uh, you, it is, uh, I would say it's required watching because you get to watch the professionals, do, you know, ply their trade on air. You get to watch them make decisions 
get to literally watch them work. It's invaluable. It's like a masterclass. And it's fun. And it's lighthearted. It's just, it's just absolutely wonderful. So please go check them out. Uh, Langtime Studio. Um, so I was on Langtime Studio for the past number of Saturdays. Uh, we were playing a family feud style game called Conline Con- Conflict. Very fun. Works just like um, Family Fruit, except all the questions are conlang related. By some miracle, right, my team ended up winning the thing, so I made three appearances. Now, I say by some miracle, not because I have no faith in my team, it's because I have no faith in me. Uh, my team was Jesse Peterson, uh, Babe Laridian, and myself, and I thought, like, they had a handicap with having me on the team, but apparently that wasn't the case, and we ended up winning the thing. So there are three quizzes where yours truly here, or three game shows where yours truly is there. Uh, I will link all three. Um... So you can go check it out if you want. Uh, they're very fun. They're very, very fun. Lots of banter was had. Um, yeah. I highly recommend checking them out. Cool. Absolutely. That sounds great. It was a blast. Um, I had some fun doing some photoshopping as well. Spoilers. for Well, spoilers, but like as a sort of Easter egg. Uh, you should go check out the photoshops I, do, I, was done, uh, I had done. Banter was had. Um, okay, uh, thou, those are my two announcements, Bill. Uh, I think you want to say something about Vulcan Trekkie Forty Five. I really hope it's all positive and not negative, Bill. <laughs> I feel like you're alluding to something there, but I've no idea what. No, no. I just the way I phrase it, you have something to say about Vulcan right. Trekkie. <laughs> made it sound like you were going to be like, now, now, Vulcan Trekkie, tot, tot, tot. <laughs> Anyhow, what's up with what's up with Vulcan Trekkie? Uh, so this is a comment from the Reddit thread on the last episode, uh, where Vulcan Trekkie forty five frequent contributor, longtime fan, um, asks if the Abeski are that diverse. So this is in in response to what I wrote for the last episode, which was kind of uh, brought up the the concept that the Abeski aren't a monolithic culture. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, that, so they ask, if the Abeski are that diverse, I'd be curious to know how they regard that diversity. Do they try and paper it over like the French do? Uh, or is it more like America, which uh, acknowledges diversity and uses that knowledge and data to try and make up for the inequalities that arise because of it? Um, th- there isn't any... So my, my response to that is there isn't any greater structure to Abeski society. It isn't a country. It isn't a, a single state. Um... So it is a somewhat loose um, collection of cities and smaller settlements. So I guess attitudes probably vary. Uh, what keeps them all together or what unifies them into being a Besky is the shared language and uh, shared cultural practices. Um, there are probably some people that would fall within certain people's definitions of Abeski and outside other certain people's definitions. It's not a, a hard and fast thing. Um, and I think most people generally would see it as being a bit loose. The The core that I would imagine most people would um, see, as, like everyone would agree that this is a Abeski, would be the cities. Mm-hmm. Um, the people in the cities who speak Abeski and have, you know, uh, an Abeski uh, background, Abeski, like uh, parentage and stuff. Um, and then the the towns and th- the smaller towns and the farms and stuff, they would see the towns the, and the big cities as being Abeski and themselves as being Abeski, but the reverse might not be true. You know, the, the cities m- might see the, the more rural people as being less Abeski than themselves. Is this in any way analogous to, like, ancient Greek? I'm getting ancient Greek vibes with city-states and, like, things like that. Not consciously uh, elaborate okay. on that. Uh, well, I was hoping you'd elaborate on that in that you might know a little bit more than I do about ancient Greece <laughs> and whether or not it is comparable. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, because nope. you, I guess you often hear, you often hear, yeah, of the city-states. Yeah. Um, and how like they are kind of united ish via shared culture i'm assuming also shared language i'm so sorry that i don't know much about ancient greece and um, it just as you were talking it reminded me of that vibe yeah so like thrace and sparta and athens will potentially conflict with each other but they're mm-hmm. all 
Greeks in opposition to the Persians. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, in, in that sense, yeah, probably. That would probably be a, a fair fair analogy to draw. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, I, I, I also have a thing from Vulcan Tracky, um to bring up. Cool. Now, uh, now, I shall put them on blast. No, I'm joking. joking. Um, Vulcan Trekkie also left another message in the Reddit um, just to point out that overly sarcastic productions, the YouTube channel, have a, a video called Miscellaneous Myths, The Book of Invasions. Recall from the last episode, uh, we talked about um, Irish mythology being, I think what I, I re- refer to as something like bad fan fiction of the Bible. Um uh, where they just like take the biblical narrative and just ham fist Irish traditions in there, which I think is hilarious. Um, the over sarcastic productions has a real short little explainer video that goes into like the whole story in a way that I didn't. So if anyone was interested by that, go check it out. Links in the show notes. About the uh, bad fanfic of the Bible, mm. a lot of the Arthurian stuff is kind of interesting to look at from that lens that was that's that's that was written by your man jordan yeah what <laughs> okay maybe maybe the reference is wrong here sorry who wrote wheel of time what's your man's name oh yeah robert jordan there's, there's a lot of arthurian right. that, stuff that in, was, in the wheel of time yeah that, that was that was the joke i was going for there that didn't work i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> that's okay uh, <laughs> that, that's on me i missed it um so i mean th- that's about like a lot a lot of the stuff in in the arthurian mythology is about uh, achieving the Holy Grail, right? Mm-hmm. And that's an interesting word. Grail, this is a total, total tangent, but what, what's a grail? Uh, li- like, but you're asking for what's the meaning of that word, or you're asking for what I think the Holy Grail is? Like, what's the meaning of the word? Uh, I don't know what a grail is, other than, like, I would have just said it's a chalice because of the Holy Grail. Yeah. Hmm. But I, I, I've never come across the word grail being used other than the Holy Grail, but yet everyone knows that it means a cup which I kind of, I realized that a couple of years ago and I was baffled by it. Now, listen, Ian McKellen told me that it's not the Holy, it comes from the French sang Real, which means royal blood. Sure, yeah, the sang Real or sang Real, yeah, there's, there's um, uh, something there, but uh, whether that's a, a backwards etymology, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know either. That was a joke in that, uh, that's in the, the Da Vinci Code. Um, oh right, I haven't seen it. Yeah, I didn't, that, know, I didn't know Ian McKellen was in it. Yeah, he's like the um, old wise Grail uh, historian fella who gets killed at the start. Uh, no, 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 oh. no. I don't want to. Well, I, can we spoil a thing that's been out for so long? But no, he doesn't get killed at the start. Okay. Um, that's another old wise historian fella. Okay. <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, but yeah, uh, they the the protagonists show up at Ian McKellen's gaff, and then he gives uh, Sophie, one of the the the, the not Tom Hanks character, uh, a spiel about the whole like central conspiracy of the film, and right. he talks about the Holy Grail, and he's like sang real. Uh, royal blood so the grail is not a chalice it's actually the bloodline the chalice being symbolic of like uh like female genitalia you know like mm-hmm. the v-shape of a chalice so it's about the bloodline of christ and there's a sort of like a central role that mary magdalene played in in the the actual in their eyes big biblical narrative like it was all about mary magdalene and her uh, mm-hmm. uh no not mary magdalene no no no, it's all about Jesus and his union of a woman and how he married and had yeah, Mary, uh, Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Sorry, yes, it was Mary. I'm sorry, sorry. My my biblical stuff isn't that that great. Um. So anyway, that's all that is to say. That's where that, that's where that joke came from. Sangreal. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> Tangent City. Um. So a lot a lot of the the Arthurian stuff is about like achieving the Grail. Um. And in the earlier stories that are recorded, um, the the knights and Arthur and stuff, they're looking for the Holy Grail, and it's something that can't be achieved, and it's kind of a metaphor for, um, like att- att- attaining perfection. Hmm. Um, and then in later stories, there's this knight character called Percival, who only appears like quite a while into the existence of uh, Arthurian myths that are recorded, and 
he's the strongest and he's the coolest and he's the hottest and he gets the grail. So it was like someone was really into Arthurian stories and then just kind of didn't get the underlying thing and wrote this like cool fanfic about it, about this <laughs> awesome guy who does everything. And I, I love that. I just think like, people have always just been the same. <laughs> but like, well, that's fair. But it must be such a letdown narratively when it's just like, yeah, yeah, this, this majestic thing that no one could acquire, I acquired it and it was a cup. Like, where, where do you go from that? It's like it's the ending can never live up to all of the the hype that's been built up, you know. Yeah, I, I think you know by by achieving it, they also like get grace or heaven or whatever. Okay, like it's it's still somewhat metaphorical. It's not just a mug. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it'd be funny if it was just a mug. Like he shows up and he's like, "Oh, this it? Damn it!" <laughs> and it just goes home back to the farm not, not even special or anything doesn't have any magic powers <laughs> no yeah yeah it's, no, it's just a mug that says like I love my dad on it that's it <laughs> best messiah ever <laughs> yeah right <laughs> okay now anyhow uh, final point to follow up on my part uh, before we crack into some world building is uh, literally everyone got on to me um, I'm, I'm using the word literally here figuratively obviously as one should um, about the inverted axes stuff from the last show I talked about how uh, the captain she likes to invert all the axes uh, and I was saying that's madness from my perspective and then it was also uh, I was also a bit angry at Baldur's Gate 3 for not allowing you to invert the axes and I was shouting about it being an ex- 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 accessibility issue Um yeah. So uh, everyone in Reddit was like, I invert my y-axis. Now, everyone agreed that you don't invert the x-axis. Thank God we're all on the same page about that. But loads of people were like, I invert my y-axis. What are you talking about? You're the weird one here. And I think I might be the weird one here. And I'm willing to accept this because, yeah, again, everyone does it. Um, was I think it was Rec Jensen was like, the first thing I do when I get a, a new Mac or something, I make sure to turn off, I think off natural scrolling which basically inverts the y-axis when you're scrolling through your thing. Um, and just for funsies, I tried to do that on the computer. I was like, no, oh, no, 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 that's not how trackpads work. So I am a firm, I guess, whatever standard y-axis person. And I don't understand people who invert the y-axis. I get why you're doing that, like flight simulators and things like that. Or uh, uh, what's called historical gaming practice or whatever. But I can't, I cannot get on board with this. This is madness as my eyes. But I will acknowledge I am strange. I'm the weird one. Um, I don't automatically know what X and Y refer to. I have to check every time. Wow. I yeah. thought you were going to say, I don't know what inverted or standard is. I need to check. Not that you don't know what X, but, but Bill, graphs, yeah? X yeah. horizontal, Y vertical? Sure. And then I, I will forget that in one hour. Which really? Is like, yeah, it's to- it's totally arbitrary. There's nothing for me to, to for me to remember it by. But no, 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 but that's what I'm saying. Like the thing to remember it is all the graphs we were exposed to in school, like x y axis on the graph. Sure. Do you mix up x and y axis on the graph? This is so intriguing to me. Yeah. Wow. I have to check which is which. Wow. That's wild. I don't, because like, because it's it's totally arbitrary. So there's no like, there's nothing I can hang that information on to remember it. Hmm. I guess. I guess you could mnemonic it. You could be all like, a Y has a vertical line. Is the only thing with a straight vertical line. Therefore, Y is vertical. Uh, only sometimes does it have a straight vertical line. But maybe. maybe oh. Work. I mean, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it is slanted. I was going yeah, to say, in fact, I was I going to, I, yeah, but I guess, I, again, I'm thinking in terms of like the graph where you'd capitalize these letters. You'd never have lowercase um, x, y. I, I was going to what? say, um, yeah, Lower, the capital x. italic. No, capitals, Bill. Am I? What? what? <laughs> Wait, are you trolling me? Am I just so wrong here? Hold on. Hold no, on. I've, uh, what? That's Wait. madness to me. It'd be like lowercase <laughs> and italic, like, like the algebraic. X and Y. No, no, but that, but that's precisely why you wouldn't want to use the algebraic X and Y because it gets confusing. Okay, I've just looked up Cartesian coordinate system on Wikipedia, and the first graph here has the like 
lowercase italic x and y on, on the axes okay so i'm seeing a bunch of pictures that have uh, i'm seeing a mixture i'm seeing i'm seeing capitals and uh now admittedly i'm seeing an awful lot more lowercase but i am seeing capitals as well um okay I, i'm willing to take the l on that one i think a little bit um, there's an l now <laughs> yeah it's the it's for three-dimensional graphs <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, oh, maybe you could remember it with X being like, um, like it, it looks like it forms two arrows on the horizontal and the line goes through the two arrows. But then it, it occurs to me that X yeah. is re- reflectionally symmetrical in all axes. So it, <laughs> <laughs> it won't work for all of them. <laughs> uh, that's wild. I have never heard of that before. That's mad. Um, speaking of madness, I just, while we're on the su- subject of video games, just I, real fast, I just want to complain about a thing and maybe ask about what's happening with the world because I'm clearly disconnected from gaming culture. Um, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. It's been out for a while. I bought it. I've played it. Um, I'm pretty sure we haven't talked about this, but I've been meaning to talk about this for a while. Uh, I have about 120 hours in the game. No, that's not true. It's about 110, I think. I'm over 100 hours into the game, right? Okay. And the way I play games is I like to try and do everything, like, which is just, uh, it's exhausting. I don't know why I'm like this, but I am. I hate myself for it. Um, but every side quest, every little thing, I try and do it. Hence the incredible amount of hours I have. And I am still nowhere near finishing the game. Um, and I don't know if this is indicative of modern AAA gaming or just this particular game. But like, this game is too big. There's too much stuff. And I hate to complain about that because you can see the capitalists come along and be like, well, you said there was too much stuff. Now we give you nothing and we microtransaction the life out of you to like get content or whatever. But like, it's so, they're so, they're so big. Like you need to be a professional gamer to actually play this game and to consume all the content. Like I can only afford to play like tops, maybe an hour or two per day in the morning time before work. Uh, that's if I forego walking or exercising and <laughs> things like that. Um, and to do that, it just takes days, it, it takes weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months to just clear a single game. And like, I don't remember things being like this. Like, I remember, like, back in the day, I remember, like, if you if you had, like, 100-ish hours in a game, that was like, you really uh, completed all the game. I have 100 plus. I'm still not finished the main storyline. Like... Is this normal, Bill? Am I weird? What's going on in the world? Why aren't games shorter? Or why aren't specifically big, like big budget AAA games shorter? Are they increasing in length? I mean, I think if people are paying the, the cost of a AAA game, they, they feel like they should be getting a lot of uh, time out of it. Yeah, like I'm not advocating that like a AAA game should be done in about 10 hours and then all the extra content should be another 10 hours. But like... I don't know. I spent 70 quid on a game. I would be more than happy if, you know, to 100% the thing, to unlock every single thing is like a 120-hour job or something like that. Hmm. Um, like I don't And you feel want... you're nowhere near that with, with Rebirth? Like, I still have, I still have like, the main storyline chapters to go, and lots yeah. of them. And then, then tech, I think technically, once you clear it, you should you should really do a new game plus on hard mode to unlock more things, which means you do the whole thing again. And it's like, what is this? And I guess, I guess for me, anyways, what I want to do is I want to spend a boatload of money, uh, or I want to spend money, but I want to feel like I get like quality for it and not bloat. Do you know? I don't want mm. length for the sake of length. I want yeah. like something that's really well put together. Um. And it's just everyone seems to think that rebirth is this groundbreaking, groundbreaking thing. But I'm just like, I think it's a little bit monotonous. Like it's the same crap over and over again. Um, and I just, I just don't know if this is the way modern games are going. Maybe it is. It makes me sad. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> but I mean, GTA is coming out sometime in 2026 or something. I, I have until 2026 to try and finish this this game <laughs> and like that's not even a joke like i because of videos and you know podcasts and life and things like that i haven't played playstation in about three weeks and again i can only do like an hour or two a day if everything works out perfectly 
I've already lost three weeks. Like it's, it's that's like a month gone. It's going to take me years to finish this bloody game. Or maybe I'm just old, Bill. That's the thing. Maybe I'm an adult and I can't. I'm, maybe kids are like, "This is perfect." What are you talking about? Like, I get home from school and I game for for seven hours. I cleared rebirth in the space of a month. It's it's fine. Um, maybe I'm just old and I don't like that. I'm getting old. I don't know. You'll, you don't have to. I don't have to play it. I you no, I, I I don't. I feel bad because I spent the money on it. But it, really, I think I've I've at that point. I don't really have a whole bunch of um. What's the word? Um, I'm looking for will to go back to Rebirth. I'm just like I I, I look at him like oh Christ, the trek through the desert has not ended. Oh. Um. Anywho, anywho, uh, folks, let me know your thoughts on this. What's the story of AAA games? Do you find them bloated? Um. Do you find them too long? Do you think the industry is in a good place at the moment? Tell me why I'm wrong about this because I must be because people love this apparently. Um. Anyhow, follow up done. Mm, I have to issue a correction. Oh, oh, sorry, Bill. You have the floor. The fanfic Arthurian Knight isn't Percival. It's Galahad. It's Galahad. Yeah, okay. I was mistaken. Well, congratulations on the live updates. That's uh, yeah. that's good. So that's some that's some professional podcasting right there. Um, <laughs> speaking of professional podcasting, do we uh, should we go into Werbling? Let's. <laughs> World building. World building. Up, Tim. Further to your letter wait, of wait, life. Wait, wait, wait. Are we not going to do any sort of intro? Or are we just going to go straight into it? I know. You didn't ask me anything, so I thought I just went, kind of went straight into it. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, further developments in the ongoing uh, society-wide uh, labor disputes in Abeski. Hmm. Okay. Up, Tim. Further to your letter of last night, we have approved an extension of credit and authority to stop the Valdian foundry from reaching an accommodation with the striking workers. Such an outcome would be disastrous both strategically for company interests and socially for the overall health of Abeski society. The vote to agree to the workers' demands must be defeated. To this end, you must purchase as many shares in the foundry as is possible or otherwise secure the votes of those who hold significant control, using whatever incentives and persuasion you deem necessary. Orders to this effect have been delivered to Captain Pofian, instructing her to liaise with you. Consider all requests for credit approved and underwritten by the Eastern Office. Defeating the vote is of primary importance. Should you fail to secure sufficient control, the vote must be prevented. In this event, Captain Pofian will assume authority in this affair. Should the agitators resist the transfer of the foundry into Tamari ownership, Captain Pofian will assume authority in this affair. Under the captain's command, you are to provide whatever logistical or material support she requires. It is imperative that we prevent this capitulation to the agitator's tyranny. Yours, Alet. Finance Board Eastern Office Representative. Letter to Aptsem Tsi Yechesh, Commercial Director, Tamar Company Opvev Bureau. Nice. Very short this, this week, month, year, day. Quarter. Quarter? That's a short one. I guess last time it was... I, Am I correct in thinking that last time we had a long one? Uh, um, I don't remember what was last time. Um, the ethnography. Either. Oh, let's see how long was that. It was longish, yeah. Hmm. So we got a bit of balance here. Um. All right. Unions striking workers trying to reach agreements uh, and being prevented so uh, from doing so by higher up powers. That's the basic shtick. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So with this Valdin foundry, uh, what do we mean by foundry here? Like like sort of ironwork sort of place? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not like exactly. a mint or anything. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's some striking workers uh, and the Valdin foundry wants to, oh, okay, wants to, wants to accommodate these striking workers. Is this an unusual development? Do they want to do this? Yeah, so we haven't really seen before any of the companies 
seeking to reform or to uh, make peace with um, mm. the labor movement. And here, the the Valiant Company, who are a kind of a similar company, sort of rival company to the Tamari, um, have decided, or the certainly the ones in control of this particular forge, of uh, particular foundry in Otvev, have decided to um, give in or to, to kind of meet some of the workers' demands. I'm assuming these demands are the standard fare, like better working hours, better pay, that sort of crap. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, reasonable. Stuff. Um, reasonable stuff, right? Um, um, what do you mean? No one wants to work an eighty-hour week. Come on. <laughs> um, the letter writer then, Alette. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the Eastern Board, uh, the Finance Board Eastern Office representative. Uh, that's she's a representative of what company? The Tamar Company. Right. He. Why is it uh, he? Sorry, sorry. Uh, why is the Tamar Company? Or is the Tamar Company getting involved here with the Valdin Company's affairs because they they don't they dislike the precedent that is about to be set? Of exactly. A, a, yeah. Okay. Grant. That's a strikes me as a bit of a overstep of kind of like stay in your lane sort of job. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. That. Ooh. Beginnings of open intercompany rivalry? Question mark. Question mark. I mean, it's it's happened before. Like they 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 have fought before, um, the companies. But it would be kind of a rare enough thing for them to interfere in the operation of each other's businesses in this way. It was just like no particular reason. It's kind of just not the custom, right? Yeah, yeah. That it, that that strikes me as kind of yeah a good policy to have. Let let us do our thing, each of us, and leave each other alone. And we're fine. Um, that's really interesting. I wonder if um yeah, like the grounds for kicking up a stink. I wonder if the the resolution here is that the companies they they they're forced the companies to get at their throats, and then the companies end up kind of just doing irrevocable damage to each other. Uh, and thus weakening them as a whole. That'd be a really interesting turn of events. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be like the grounds folk rise up. It would be more like the company's collapse, which is kind of, I don't know, kind of thinking out loud, kind of an interesting sort of thing. Um, and it's, I, I guess, also pretty scary here is that uh, Alesh, he's just, I, I guess he just opened calling for like all sorts of violence. Use whatever, quote, use whatever incentives and, incent- incentives and persuasions you deem necessary. Mm-hmm. If you can't secure votes, so I'm assuming that is just a bare face. Get in there and start, like you know, physically harassing people. Um, yeah. If if you can't if you can't persuade them through financial means. Yeah. So that's that's what uh, the the captain's orders are there. He's like Alet isn't saying this out loud, but it's it's very clear what he means. Um, you know, if you need to physically persuade uh, to intimidate. Um, the, the people who control the votes, then you, you, we're giving you authority to do that. First, first thing is to buy it out. Second thing right. is bribery, and then you know escalate that into intimidation, escalate that into violence. The buying it out would be a good strat though, because that's just that's just more kind of like um, mercantile colonialism. No, you just take over this asset um, yeah. and spread your power. So it works out well for them, I guess, in both instances because it's like we get to show striking workers that this isn't going to work in mm-hmm. the future and also we get to acquire we get to acquire an asset which is pretty nice and um, you know, i'd imagine there's there's some reason whatever it may be that they haven't previously tried to take over this business the the tamar company um you know it, it was it was deemed risky or not 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 worth the investment or whatever but it's been decided that it is worth it now to prevent the kind of the domino falling of of people um, giving in or people me- reaching accommodations with the, with the strikers, right? But like you said, it was kind of a custom thing, wasn't it? Where it's just yeah. like they each kept to their own lane. But now that there's this agitation, it's kind of like um, norms have been broken, and we're yeah. willing to go beyond what we would previously have have done. Exactly. Is is the is uh, I can't, this has almost certainly been answered before, but I can't remember. Is it Tamar Company the big player in this space? Like of the companies, is it the largest? Um. I don't know, hmm. but it's the most um, it's the most aggressive. Okay, so the Valdin company should be scared of this of of the Tamar company making moves here. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. I, I hate to bring real world stuff into this, but it's just it's uh, it's just very kind of like um, hits home, I suppose, when you hear things like quote the vote must be prevented, uh, like sort of stop the steal sort of thing. You know, <laughs> um, it's just yeah, it's it's crazy that we live in a world where we're we're 
this sort of fiction has kind of occurred ish uh, IRL you know mental stuff well um th- this ahead. is more preventing like the the board of directors from from meeting rather than like a mass democratic popular vote uh, no I know but it's shades of the same thing you know mm-hmm. um it's not it's not massively far removed yeah. um tell me about captain Puffian. we have um we've not met this person before i don't think no she's a airship captain controls a vessel and some marines and is based in Otvev and uh has has received separate orders as outlined here um that if uh Aptem requires some of the the shareholders to be uh intimidated then she is to give her or you know send her marines to do that she's laying in wait ready to lay it the spacket down when time calls yes and if yeah. they don't get the uh the sufficient votes to to defeat the the the, the motion then uh, she has, as it says, separate orders to prevent it from happening. So by, I don't know, whatever that may be, uh, stopping people from, from getting to the vote or from maybe actually like outright killing someone or t- taking out all the board. Um, or if the vote is successful and the Tamar Company will then have control of the foundry and the workers continue to strike and, and resist the, the new ownership, then... Uh, she's uh, ordered to break the strike through violent means. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, horrifying. Um, to me, it's just, again, real world politics here. It's just, it is crazy how it's like unions are like, hey, we were just kind of like uh, better conditions for our workers, you know, fair pay, good working hours, etc. cetera. Um, you know, that they're not just slaves to the company. And then it's like, that needs to be shut down immediately. <laughs> and like the, the, the capitalists come in and they're just kind of like, no. Not even slightly. Would that we could employ children for this again, you pesky unions, <laughs> you know? Like, it's just, it's crazy. And it's mad. Again, I'm sorry about the real world sort of politics stuff here, folks, but uh, it is mad to see, um, I, I guess, like, uh, sort of normal people's attitude towards humans, like the Kool-Aid has, uh, humans towards unions. Um, <laughs> uh, because, like, it's kind of like the Kool-Aid has been drank. Like, I, every so often on Reddit and stuff, I will see, like, reposts of TikTok videos where some normal person, or at least I'm assuming is a normal person, like a worker, not a capital holder or whatever, will just go on about, will make a video about how terrible unionization is and how it's the downfall of everything. And, like, this is in your best interest to get behind the u- union. Like, what, mm. what, what is this like? It's just, it's so weird that, like, particularly in the States, I think the union culture is not that strong. Whereas here, it's, like, super duper strong. Or at least... I, I think it probably Scandinavia probably does it better than we do but like um, the idea of like union strikes is just kind of like it's a natural thing in light of life here you know um, so that thing of people seeing themselves not as, as workers but as temporarily frustrated millionaires that's just it yeah that's exactly it which is just I just think it's the wrong way of, of, of viewing things you know um, but um, final two questions on this Mm-hmm. Uh, so I should have opened with this. Who's Aptsem, uh, the person who is receiving the letter? Who is this? So Aptsem is uh, the commercial director in the Tamar Company. Um, like, it's not a depot. Depot is more like an outlying thing. But in, in like the office in Opvev. like It's kind of one of the main people, one of their main people for operations in the city of Opvev. Right, right, right. So the, the big wig above Aptsem is writing in to be like, this is what's going on. You need to sort it out. You can't do it peacefully. Here's here's the boy all, or here's the here's the girl to call, and she'll come in and she'll crack heads. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. And then, uh, I guess the final thing is oh no, no, actually two two more things. Actually, sorry, there was an additional thing. Um, how do the other companies feel about this? We have the Valdine Company at play. We have the Tamar Company at play. What are the other companies? Are they watching over uh, over the shoulders, being like, we need to see how this shakes out because it it could mean something for us in the future, or are our sides being formed? What's going on? There, I mean, there's probably some resistance to the idea of reaching an accommodation within the Valiant Company um, itself, right? Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's not a monolith, um, but there's enough people uh, willing to, to you know to sit down and, and work out a deal um, at the the foundry in Otvev for this to be a concern. Yeah, I mean, like, the other companies 
they're trying to to balance ending the the dispute and ending the the overall agitation in society with keeping themselves going so it's kind of a some of them are probably leaning towards reform now that's a good thing i'm i'm glad well it depends how you feel about reform i mean it, it, you know can you reform a, a a deeply deeply broken society like if you just like if if the capitalist reform you're just going to re- replicate more capitalism not actually solve the problem I mean, yes. Yeah, that's fair. You would need a fundamental overhaul of society, mm. uh, which I, I don't see happening here because I guess this is my pessimistic outlook of the world. It's just when things are so ingrained, it's not really going to change. Mm-hmm. Um, you would need the utter destruction of the society and its replacel- it, it being replaced with something entirely different in order for it to be like meaningful change, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's depressing to say out loud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the 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 final thing is uh just the, the last line it is imperative that we prevent this capitulation to the agitator's tyranny again i just love the way it's phrased like that where it's like this tyranny we speak of is just being like hey can we get paid fairly and work decent hours that's the tyranny that's that's occurring here like mm-hmm. um which is just it's just so like propaganda stuff you know i'm sure they believe it too but it's like no one should actually believe this. That's exactly what I'm going for. Yay! Um, speaking of what you're going for, what did I miss? Mm, nothing. Yay! Show's over, right? I'll see you next month. Bye-bye. See you next, see you next month. Um, we've <laughs> met Alette a couple times before. Um, we have, yes, yes. 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 Uh, I think both as the writer and as a receiver, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean... Yeah, it's shorter than my usual, but I kind of said everything I'd, I intended to say, so. Unlike a AAA game, no blow <laughs> from Bill. Put me in, Square Enix. I can do it. <laughs> uh, I have so many things to talk about, Bill, uh, in this, and some of them are really, I guess, one thing in particular is quite complicated, and uh, I'm worried about having to do it having to talk because like having to talk through grammatical structures is very difficult so i don't know how well this is going to go so i'm going to just start with the easy stuff first put some easy stuff uh, to you to make calls and then we'll we'll wade into the more complicated stuff that sounds smart great okay you know the way with the oh sorry folks for folks we are creating a language for the abeski people we just mm-hmm. heard about links in the show notes to a reference grammar uh, for these Abeski people and for the Abeski language, if you want to check it out. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is in said grammar. Um, so you can kind of read along as you're listening, if you so desire. You had mentioned, Bill, that you want this to be a, a v- verb initial language, a VSO language. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as you also wanted, a uh, relatively free word order. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I persuade you um that and I, I believe I believe you had said I hope you said this and I'm not just making it up that um you you want the verb to come first but like do free stuff after the verb you know swap the object swap the subject whatever as long as you just have the verb out the front we're great okay. did you say that or am I making that up uh, I, I don't remember specifically but it sounds likely it sounds likely all right regardless can I say would I can I ask you that we do away with that idea and we allow stuff to come before the verb? um sometimes so like default utterances just that that have no sort of like emphasis or there's nothing special going on they'll just be vso Mm -hmm. um but like you can if you want shove stuff in front of the verb to do some emphasis stuff if you want yeah great that that makes my life very easy thank you for that very good I, i almost certainly i think i might have made up the fact that you just firmly want v initial um so that's good thank you yeah, I mean, I'd like it to be the default, but I mean, you know, as I said, free, free-ish word order is fine. It will definitely be the default. Yeah, that's Ooh. just definitely the case. Like standard utterances will just be VSO. Now, uh, the other thing is, this is just a fun little idea. I wonder, I could, uh, I wanted to run by you uh, so I can stick it in the lexicon. Do you remember we have the abessive case and the abessive case marks uh, lacking or absence of something? Basically, it does the job what the, that the preposition without in English does um do you yeah. recall this yeah i do remember yeah. that um so where it's kind of or, or i mentioned the last time it's like less the suffix less so homeless 
is basically the word home in the abyss of case. It's like without a home, lacking a home. Sure. Um, so it just dawned on me the last day, uh, if we have the word for sky in the language, hemo, uh, which I just think is a great word, the great sound of that word builds. So well done, hemo. Thank you. I really like that. Um, if we stick that in the abyssive, you get skyless, right? Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, could that mean, like derivation sort of thing, uh, could it mean that you're unemployed or perhaps grounded? Um, you are without the sky. You're away from the sky. You're not in the air. You're not at work. You're unemployed. Or could it be a kind of a derogatory term for the groundsfolk? Oh! That's a much better idea. <laughs> yeah, okay. Derogatory term for groundsfolk. Brilliant. Uh, I love that. I'm reminded of Final Fantasy X uh, where... Um, there's this scene, uh, sorry for anyone who doesn't know what Final Fantasy X is or hasn't played it, but uh, there's this scene where there's a character called Kimari in your group. Uh, he's like a big giant blue wolf man of person. Course. Of course. Um, it's not really, oh no, actually not wolf, more cat-like, uh, like lion-y maybe? I don't know. Uh, but anyhow, uh, they're meant to have like a unicorn horn, but he lost his unicorn horn in a battle with his like um, bigger rivals. Uh, the the race called the Ronso, um, and they all meet in this tavern at one stage, and he uh, he is slagged by these rivals, and they call him Hornless, and that's seen as a sort of like um, almost like a sort of like you are no longer of our culture, you are you are unronso, you are Hornless, um, so that just reminds me of Skyless, um, so I really like that, so I'm gonna chuck that, I might chuck that in the dictionary then at some stage, yeah, Ooh. cool. He looks, I I just I just googled him here, Kamari. He looks like Beast from the X Men, from Grant Morrison's run. When, when Beast got a little bit more like cat-like. Correct. That that is very spot on. Yeah, very very spot on. Kamari Ronsol, what a legend. That's the, the second item. Next item, demonstratives. You asked me to make some demonstratives. Mm-hmm. Um, I have made some demonstratives. I'm going to read these demonstratives at you as a sort of kind of like. This should be like chill ASMR vibes, as I pronounce <laughs> stuff. I want you to uh, give me Get a vibe. Really close to the oh. microphone. Oh my god! You should have warned people, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read these demonstrative to you. Again, links are in the description to the to the reference grammar if you want to go check it out, folks. Um, I want you to give me a vibe check on uh, just just the overall aesthetic, right? If you like the aesthetic. I'm going to read you. We have one demonstrative in this language. We have this, that. It's the same same word. There's no distinction, right? Um, so I'm going to read you the, the demonstrative in the single, singular, okay? Uh, in all of the cases now, right? Yeah. Cool. Here we go. Va, valch, va, von, vaj, var, vath, Vai. Could you give me the fifth one there again, please? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, Vaj. Oh, after that one. Var. With a rolled or. I can't roll my or. I like that. Oh, good. Oh, thank you. Okay. I like, so I these... like all of them, but I like I liked the in that one. Good. Good, you're good. Okay. Um, so that that's the demonstrative and singular. Here it is in the human plural, declined in all of the cases. Uh, vach. Vachalch. Vachi. Vachen. Vahej, Vahur, Vahath, Vahai. Cool. Cool. Good. Here it is in the plural for animate noun. So if you want to say like this bird, uh, in fact, the word for bird you had was nonka. So you'd say Vaku nonka if you want to say this bird. So Vaku, uh, Valch, Vaki, Vakon, Vakuj, Vakur, Vakath, Vakai. Cool. Sound good. Yeah. Good, good. So that gives me confirmation that both, one, you like the sound of the demonstrative, which is va in its base form, and you also like the sound of all the case endings we came up with, because those are all the endings smashed onto the demonstrative. Good. Cool. Um, Can I just clarify? Of course. So the order of the the cases, that like you read them out in there, is nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive, dative, locative, instrumental, committative, abessive. Uh, no vocative, because you wouldn't really put a vocative on a demonstrative, I don't think. Like, hey that, Good. 
point. Good, you would you wouldn't do that. But the the that's the good point. The vocative case is just simply you put a ah in front of everything. So if you were to call yar te yarden, you would do a ah, yar. All right. That's it. Um, well, that, very that's simple. easy. That's easy for Irish to remember. Precisely, precisely. That I actually didn't do that because of Irish. I did that because I just wanted to make sure it's just always the same. So there's no big complicated mm-hmm. paradigm going on there. Um, so all this is to say that the cases are done. So if anyone wants to go check it out, I have fully fleshed out the nominative, vocative, accusative, genitive, dative, locative, instrumental, committative, abessive. All the allophones or all the different realizations of the suffixes are marked in reference grammar if you want to go check it out. By God, Bill, if we ever do a second language, we're, we're doing less cases, okay? <laughs> took so long <laughs> but it was fun i like it. it was very it was it was, it was a lot of crack um right so that's that okay i want to do a thing called suffix aufnahme i don't know how comfortable you're going to be with this called i what? need suffix aufnahme how's your german can you untangle that it's a german word that aufnahme. sounds familiar but i can't remember what it means Okay, so I, I I actually don't know. I'm just guessing based on feel. I think it means something like um, uptake, like Aufnahme. I think oh, yeah, it's to... naming is, is the take, isn't it? To name right, is. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and suffix is obviously suffix, right? Um, <laughs> this 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 translates or not translate, but what it means is it means case stacking, right? Um, it's a thing that Australian languages do, where which is uh, quite unusual. Um, in uh, other languages. Um, you usually have one case marker on a word, right? Um, like, think German, des hundes. You put the ES at the end of hund there, des hundes. And that's it, right? right. Um, Australian languages love to put multiple case markers. So this would be the equivalent of, like, you take the EN ending in German from, like, den, and you do, like, hunden s. You put two case markers on a thing uh, for complicated reasons i don't want to get into um i would like to try and pull this trick in this language to to make your language not have a relatively free word order but to have make it have a radically free word order um how would you feel about that if we just went a bit bananas with the free word order what would that look like you you could uh you could say things like really comfortably and totally naturally you could say things like front i see of ship uh, which to an English brain is nuts. So when you say, I see the front of a ship, you most languages will not let you split apart front of ship. That's one right, English, yeah. okay. one phrase. But in this language, we could split that apart and just shove it around. So like front, I see of ship. I see of ship front. Uh, or like I see big man, for example. Uh, you could do like big, I see the man, uh, which is really odd. Uh, like me- most languages will not do this. Most languages aren't that radical. Ancient Greek did it. Uh, classical Nahuatl did it. Um, I think while Piri does it, but Mohawk does it. Maybe it's Mohawk. I can't remember. Uh, so a handful of languages do this. Uh, but I would like to try and use this case stacking thing to have the language do this. How do you feel about that? Uh, basically, yeah, the I- question is... Okay, I was going to say the question basically is tell me how free you want things. Like, do you want to go more like German where you can kind of just move stuff around the verb? Uh, or you want to go like all holds barred, move stuff around no matter what you do? I mean, I guess I was kind of thinking that like the all the bits could be moved around for per, like so the verb, subject and object and stuff could be moved around. I hadn't considered like splitting up noun phrases or like splitting adjectives away from nouns which is kind of what you're talking about yeah how do you feel about that like because if you if you if you think that's weird don't like that vibe say now i have no problem uh yeeting that from the language i i think it's cool i'm not like i don't think it's necessary but if you think it's cool and you think you can make it work then yeah i'm happy to go for it i, I think i can make it work and uh, the reason why i i'm i've kind of i had there's a long protracted history bill of me on live streams trying to figure this out i've come up with about three or four different solutions to, to this thing, but I finally hit upon kind of like stock suffix of Nama because uh, remember we talked about differential object marking the last time around. Yes. Where yes. if you've an, if you've an object of a verb and you put it in the nominative, it's indefinite. You put it in the accusative, it's definite. So if you want to say, I see a man, you'd say I nominative see man nominative. If you mm-hmm. want to see, I see the man, you do I nominative see 
man accusative. And that's the man. Um, okay. I had forgotten that, but I trust you. That's fine. No, no, we definitely talked about it. Mm. Um, uh, shout out Keras for the idea. Uh, Keras Sarian. There's a fun thing that happens when these two worlds collide. This suffix of Nama stuff and this... Uh, differential object marking without getting into it you can read it in the reference grammar like i don't want to get into it too deeply you can't say uh something like i see the ship of a man you can't say that in a way that you would in english you have to use an alternate construction because of these two features hitting one another so this idea of introducing suffix of nama makes stuff really free which is cool but it also creates a kind of like creative problem that i've had to solve which i also think is quite cool um so i'm kind of falling in love with this idea uh, as it stands and if you don't utterly hate it i'd like to plow forward no i don't utterly hate it no Fantastic. Okay, right. That's that. Uh, that was the complicated talk about the what we're going to do with the case system. That was easy. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> Go team. Final thing. The next thing I need to know, because case is done, demonstrative is done, I would like, and numbers done, I would like to know about pronouns. Right? I mm-hmm. want to talk about pronouns and what you want to do with pronouns. Uh, as always, have you got any feelings about pronouns? No, I haven't really thought about it. Great. Okay. I'm going to talk. You're just going to tell me whether you like what you hear or you don't like what you hear. Okay? Mm -hmm. Cool. So, third-person pronouns. You know, he, she, it, they, or whatever. We don't have class in this language, so as a standard, we'd expect you, your language to not have he, she distinction. It would just be third-person singular, like it or they. Singular they all the time. Thoughts? How do we feel? Yeah, I'm fine with that. You're fine with that. Uh, you don't want me to build it out into something else. like uh, I, Because I, I can make, like say, a third-person pronoun for humans and one for other animates or for male and female. I can do that like as a secondary thing. At the moment, what, what kind of distinctions of noun do we have? Uh, we have... Uh, we, don't, we don't have classes as such, but we no. have an animacy kind of thing, don't we? We do. We, yeah, we, when it comes to number, we care about animacy, yeah. We don't have to care about anacy in the third person pronouns, but we can if you want. Yeah, let's. Let's. Okay, so you want to have... So basically, you you would like to have a... Yeah, one animate third person pronoun and one for inanimates. Sound good? Or do you want to do one human, one for animates, one for inanimates? Yeah, that one. That one. Okay, cool, cool. Let me just make a uh, note of that. Uh, human, animate, inanimate. Okay, cool. Um... Grant, that's what I meant by, in the show notes, class-like. Because it's almost like we're doing class, but we're just not. Um, Okay, now, next thing to think about in this is number, right? Mm. Plurals. They're not really plurals and pronouns, but just just go with me here. Um, Like, we is not really a plural of I. It's not multiple I's, do you know? Um, (laughs) Multiple egos. Like, that's not what's going on there, but we'll just use the word plural. Um... Number distinctions. You have already said in your nouns that you want just a simple number distinction. Singular, plural. That's it. Yeah. And I love you for that, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> um, but in pronouns, it is you, you can find many systems where uh, there is more number distinctions in the pronoun system than in the noun system, right? So if you want, here is a place where you can expand this. You could have like dual pronouns, or again, you can go mad with trial pronouns or et cetera, et cetera. Do you, do you want to stick with your simple singular plural distinction? Or do you want me to add in more number here? I think, I think simple, single plural. Simple. Yeah, okay. singular plural. Singular plural, that's perfect. I can do it. Uh, okay. Uh, do you know what clusivity is? So it's like inclusive or exclusive we. That's exactly it, Bill. You're very good at this linguistic stuff. Yeah. <laughs> do we want sing- do we want clusivity yeah. in our sorry, what'd you say? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. 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 Do you want me to? I I'm I'm afraid to ask you this question because I don't know if I could explain all of this on air without referencing my old video. Uh but do you want me to leave it do you want to leave it up to me as to how exactly that manifests, or do you have any strong ideas? I'm not really sure what the different ways are. Let, yeah, I'll leave it up to you for the moment. And you can okay. come back to me about what you come up with. Okay, well, just to give you a slight little flavor. Chances are, Bill, I'm just going to do the stock thing because that's the thing that arises more often. And cool. that's where you have uh, one marker for uh, we when it includes the addressee and one marker for we when it doesn't include the addressee. 
Yeah. So we, you and I are going to go to the shop. We, you, myself and someone else, not you, are going to go to the shop. That's the mm. standard exclusivity crack. But you can do things like uh, you have one marker for when it's only two participants involved and one marker for when there's more. So uh, if it was myself and yourself, Bill, there'd be one form. If it was myself and the captain, there'd be that same form again. But if it was myself, yourself and the captain, all three of us, that would be a different form. So you can play around with like number of participants there. Um, you can divide up the sort of inclusivity space in many, many different ways. I think there's eight possible ways of doing it. Um, so if you would like me to, if you give me permission to play with it, I might come up with some proposals for you. Chances are we'll go with the stock, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's fine with me. Like play with it, but I'm, I'm happy with the, the straightforward. Okay, okay. You just want to see inclusivity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Okay. Um, emphatic markers. You know, in Irish, when you say something like, um, oh, God, I can't now think of a... Uh, Dumb ta- versus dumsa. Yeah, I was trying to come up with a sentence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, in Irish, we have uh, on, on pronouns, on our inflective pronouns, we can stick sa at the end, and that adds emphasis. So, agam is at me. Um, agamsa is like at me emphasis. Um, do you want some... Not a gumsha, bro. <laughs> a gumsha, bro. <laughs> bro. It's, not, it's not a verb, so that doesn't work, but you get, you get, the, you get the idea. <laughs> not a gumsha, drehar. <laughs> drehar being the Irish word no, for... for... or ofada, <laughs> bro. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, that is bro. <laughs> um, I always find it really fun that uh, South African English, I think, has taken bro and turned it into brew which i think is just really fun like they're like yeah yeah it's like what's up brew now i'm basing that on like a handful of south african like internet people i know of um that may be an unusual thing i don't know uh maybe it's an online space thing i don't know that either but they're all south african they all have thick south african accents and they're all like brew um this is mad um emphatic markers do you want me to whack something on the pronouns to make them emphatic. And actually, before you answer that, I will say we can move stuff around for emphasis. I should make you aware of that. Okay. As in, you may, uh, it might be worth considering do we even need this when we can take these pronouns and shove them around the sentence to make them emphatic or not? Oh, I get you. Do like a Hungarian thing where, where position indicates emphasis. Em- em- emphasis, yes. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not too bothered about emphatic markers. If 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 you find a good way to do it, then play with it. But I'm not. I'm not pushed. Honestly, it would just be. It would likely just be a suffix on the um right. on the thing. I guess. Yeah. Oh, I should. I should state actually. I, uh, you had a pretty negative reaction to reduplication the last time. Um. A, a very easy way of making emphatic markers is to simply reduplicate the pronoun. So if the pronoun is no, you go no no, and that's like I emphasis. Yeah. Uh, how would you, how would you feel about that? Uh, nah. No. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Very good. Okay. I, mean, I, I like um, the emphatic markers in Irish, but I'm not. I'm not. I really like them in Irish, but I'm not. I'm not that pushed about them for a besky. Yeah. And again, you can always make things emphatic. Like yeah. worst case scenario, you could just use tone. Mm. I went to the shop. There you go. That's emphatic. Um, alien ability. Do you know what this is? I do not. Okay, so this is some languages uh, when it comes to like possessive pronouns um, and other structures as well, like my arm, my house, that sort of thing. Uh, In English, we make no distinction. We use the word my there. It's all the same, right? In some languages, they go, well, a house and an arm are two very different things, right? Like the arm is, and I always get this mixed up, it's inalienable. Uh, It is like a part of you. It cannot be removed. Um, whereas a house, you can burn your house down. You can sell your house. It's it's alienable. So they have like separate markers or they have separate strategies of marking these different types of possession, oftentimes on pronouns. Is this something you would care about? I've never thought about that in my life or heard wow. of this concept. That is mad. Yeah, really? Okay, cool. Okay. Um, I will say it's not that mad, uh, admittedly. It happens quite, quite a lot. Um no. Yeah, well, well, no. Okay, no inability. That's grand, that's grand, that's fine. Um, last thing is formality. Uh, do you want me 
to bake some formality in your pronouns. So this is think of like the tu vu stuff. Yeah. I think it, in French or a Z in, in Elf Deutsch, um, all that sort of crack. Do you want that? Now that is super duper European, I, I must say. Um, so just know that you'll be doing something that's just very, very Eurocentric here. If you were to specifically do the sort of use a plural pronoun to show respect. Or I guess before you answer that question, the Abeski, are they a sort of people that are overly concerned with politeness in their speech? Yay, nay? I would say no. I would say they're not. I mean, like, like there are definitely ways to be more polite and more formal and ways to be more casual, but I don't think it would be like a different pronoun. Okay. Okay. Or you, yeah. Okay. May- Grant, maybe like, maybe use like an older version of the pronoun to be more formal or something. Cool. Yeah. Um, and like, again, like you can a, always... a pre-mutation one or something. I don't know. But like, yeah, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say, you know, it's not like it's a courtly culture. A courtly culture. It's mad. Again, maybe just because I have the idea of kind of like um, them being British. I appreciate that there's no two vu distinction in English, but like Anymore. I associate, well, yeah, sure, sure. But I associate, when I think of like, like, Britishy things like Downton Abbey or any sort of period drama, like historical <laughs> British things. I all I can think about is just like you know weaponized politeness. That's all I can think about. So all I can, when I picture the Abeski, I'm thinking of them uh, going around being like hyper formal to indicate how like kind of civilized they are. Um, so I find it interesting that you say no to that, which is great, which is good. I mean, it's it's less kind of I guess I'm viewing the culture in a very stereotypical sort of manner, and you're vo- viewing it very. Uh, complexly which is a good thing um uh related to the the category of formality here is um how do you feel how would you feel about a class of like uh, i guess open pronouns um some languages um like jesus maybe thai uh, i can't remember um does japan no, I, I, I'm not going to make any assertions. I can't remember. Some languages, or Indian subcontinent languages, I think do a lot of this, uh, where you can basically use any noun as a pronoun. Um, it can just slot. You got, you got, you got pronouns for sure, like like I, you, etc. But at any time, you can just chuck any noun in there, and it works. So you could say things like, um, you know, will uh, will master be going to the shop? Instead of like, will you be going to the shop? Uh, or you okay. could be like, uh, will grandmother be going to the shop? And you're not talking to your grandmother. You're just using grandmother as a word that means kind of like respected senior person sort of thing. You can just slot these things in. Or uh, the, the, the uh, one of my father's favorite movies is The King and I. And one of the characters, I know this is not, probably not going to be ling- linguistically sounds, a sound. Um, but one of the characters refers to Anna from Anna the King, I think as ma'am, ma'am, uncle, as in M-A-A-M, ma'am, um, uncle being like respected elder and mm. ma'am being like, you know, you're, you're a lady. So ma'am, uncle, does ma'am, uncle wish to visit the king or whatever? That kind of crack. Or do you want to go for more just like, no, it's I, it's you, it's he, she, we're done. That's it. Mm. Is, is that hard to, to achieve? Uh, no, it's it would be a case of just defining what kind of classes of words would in, would entail. But really, it's just a case of just you stick the nouns in there. That's it. Yeah, maybe then. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna say open class, open class of pronouns. So again, that implies that like yeah, nouns can be put in there. New ones will come up the whole time. Um. That sort of thing. It's very, it's a very flexible as opposed to like our very rigid sort of set system. Is there like kind of a what's the word? Metonymy. What is that word? So it's where you use. What's, so like one one way the, the the first example I can think of is is saying you know in a press release Leinster House announced that whatever whatever and they're saying Leinster House there that means the government of Ireland. And that's metonymy that Leinster House represents are like the, the Pentagon did this. And that means that the you know United States military did this. That is a that that is a case of metaphor, uh, like a metaphoric extension, like using uh, there's the, what is the term of this? Uh, that is 
yeah, the metaphor of the part as a whole. Yeah, it's, it's called metonymy. Right, right, right. But, but what I'm saying is like, th- that is metaphorical, so not related to this pronoun thing. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I didn't realize it was called metonymy. That's it's really yeah. interesting. So uh, what, what I was thinking is like using the, like the name of the ship or using the, like just saying like vessel to refer to the captain, that the captain personifies the, the vessel or that the, the director personifies the company or something maybe. Yeah, you can totally do that. I, I don't think that's necessarily uh, related to okay. this per se. Uh, I'll but I'll come back to that idea in my own time then. I suppose I have to think about that a little more. Um, I, I, sorry, just to fully flesh this out, this idea of metonymy uh, then is a, a subset of kind of like metaphorical extensions because like we do all the, we do this crack the whole time. Like um, uh, one metaphor that, that we live by a lot in English is that feelings are containers, right? Like you say you are in love. That's like a metaphor thing. Right. Um, or we have the like, a part of the thing represents the whole of the thing. Like the White House referring to the entire government and things like that. Um, so there's a whole, I guess what I'm trying to lead up to say is that uh, there is a book that I forget. What's the name? Is it Metaphors We Live By? Hold on, let me just open the Kindle. I just want to recommend this to people. I believe, I think it was Bibliridian that made me aware that uh, there's some... I want to say maybe Australian language where um, feelings are flowers is the metaphor they have mm. there. So like, I guess you'd say something like love grows within me. They they have that sort of like mental model. Um, I could be totally wrong about the details. I'm pretty sure it came from Bibberidian. I probably butchered what the what the language is. Yeah, metaphors we live by by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. I'll throw oh, it in the show notes. Yeah, I'll throw it in show notes in case anyone's interested. Uh that's just what Bill's metonymy uh, reminded me of. Um, okay, I think that's all the information, unless you have something to bring up that I need to be able to start crafting the old uh, pronoun, pronominal system for you. Uh, no, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. It's, it's more than I would have considered had you not posed those questions to me, so I certainly can't think of further things to suggest. I mean, I, so. There are there are a lot of other things one can do here, but I just think they'd be in conflict with the way we set up the language. Like I didn't sure. bring up obviation, for example. Um, just you can Google that if you want in your own time. That just because it just it will go Don't against Google what we're right done. now. Right now, um, it's just it, it, it's it's a system of uh, anaphora. Um, yeah, again, googling. Um, okay, cool. I will come back to you hopefully soon. Hopefully next time with a. Uh, th- there is no fourth person. That's a lie. I I do not prescribe to the idea that there's a fourth person. That's ridiculous. I know I'm going to get shouted at. I think it's I think it's useless. There is there's not that. There's a third person. There's a proximate third person, an obvious third person, or potentially even a further obvious third person. There's no fourth person. That's I'm off my soapbox now. I'm going to get so much hate mail for this. Oh, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Uh, that's all I got. That might be the show. Uh, spot on an hour and 30 minutes this is perfect this is almost exactly one my neighbor Totoro <laughs> <laughs> tying it back to the start <laughs> we, we've been doing this we've been doing this so long we're just bam 90 minutes done done um, folks thank you so much for watching listening hello chat uh, if chat. you happen to, if you happen to frequent the new discord very bare bones discord channel um, hi, and thank you for doing so. Um, thanks for supporting us on Patreon. We will talk to you in hopefully one month's time. So until next time, Bill Enter out. out. Did you say Bill out? No. Oh, God. Why isn't slander? No, no, I'm glad you didn't because I would have been disgusted by that. I can't, I can't break uh-huh. the tradition. <laughs> yeah, I, I, this, is, this is exactly why I didn't say it, Bill. Thank you. No, I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll see you next time. Catch you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>